Okay. Um, you've probably seen as many sheets about stress and stress management as I have. This may be just packaged a little different to help you with some things. Things to watch for, emotional symptoms, uh, physical symptoms, you know, they're having trouble sleeping. Uh, sleep deprivation is one of the big things that results from a critical incident. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a delete button in our mind. We, we can't delete what we see. And they replay it. And, you know, that armchair quarterback thing. I, I'm going to, again, that desire to fix things. Well, they can't fix this. But listen, you know, when, when you're in briefing, when you're riding along, listen for discussions about sleep disorder, continuing headaches, um, loss of concentration. Uh, you may very well be dealing with some stuff in the area of critical incident stress management. The gentleman we were talking to at lunch had, had critical incident stress management training. I've had the training. I'm not on the state team. But I use it all the time, you know. Um, all kinds of different reactions. If, if something seems out of the ordinary, out of place, it probably is. <laughs> you know, so if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, so you can just kind of look through those. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, give you something you don't already have some working knowledge of. One of the best phrases in regards to critical incident stress is to talk about a, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. It is a natural response to feel this way. You're dealing with an abnormal situation. You, know, you, you can use this in grief situations. You're, you feel like you're going crazy. You're not going crazy. This is a normal or natural response to this kind of situation. This kind of situation is not normal. And anything you can do to minimize what they perceive as abnormal or I'm going crazy will help. But you're just trying to convey to them, no, you're not going crazy. Officer involved in shooting. Now, many times the uh, public wonders why they shot him so many times. They shot him ten times. Why did they? Why did they shoot him? Why didn't they just shoot him in the leg like they do in TV shows? Why didn't they just shoot the gun out of his hand? Yeah, <laughs> right. Why do you suppose they shoot him so many times? Huh? Reaction? You know, the sheriff in Florida who had two deputies shot and killed was asked why they shot him, the suspect, 68 times. We ran out of bullets. <laughs> okay, they are trained to shoot at body mass. That's here. They are trained to shoot as long as the threat exists. If the suspect is still holding a gun, the threat still exists. I have seen a training film where it was an actual drug bust. An officer is shot and killed in this incident. The guy's on meth. He took seven or eight rounds in the chest and kept coming. I've had a firearms instructor say they have documentation of somebody on meth or crack, I'm not sure which it was, but, but some heavy duty stuff, took a round in the heart, blew his heart out his back, and he still had enough in him to get off a round and kill an officer. Want to know why they keep shooting? Because the threat still exists. But... That's an awful lot of stress. There's a book entitled On Killing 
by a lieutenant colonel. And he went back in different wars to look at post-traumatic stress. Trying to figure out what this thing is. You know, how, how, you know they've, they've called it shell shock. I mean, there's been a lot of names over the years they've used for it. What he determined was the more eye contact there was with the enemy, the greater the post-traumatic stress. Now think about that for a minute. Our guys coming back from Vietnam had a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's eyeball to eyeball. One of the things he found is fascinating to me. He did a study of some Civil War battlefields. They found muskets with 17 or 18 rounds in them. Okay, a musket is a one-shot thing. <laughs> Why in the world would there be 17 or 18 rounds? It was eye contact with the enemy. They would raise the gun to shoot. They would look into the soul of the person they're about to shoot. Couldn't pull the trigger. Set it down, ram another round in. Back up. Oh, makes eye contact again. Can't pull the trigger. Sets it down. Ran. 17 or 18 rounds. Post traumatic stress is very real. Our, our soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, have a different kind of post-traumatic stress, but it's post-traumatic stress because it's so traumatic to them, to what they see. You can't hit the delete button. On killing, I think it's Lieutenant Colonel Gary Rasmussen, I think is his name. But On Killing is the name of the book. But it's fascinating stuff. The more... They had the, the, the contact, the, the visual contact, the harder it was. Well, you think about police situations where a suspect is shot. They're generally going to see them. They may not have eye contact, but they're going to have some kind of visual. Um, that's, that's kind of food for thought. Now, real cops... You know, we, we had an officer involved in a shooting where he got shot and then ultimately uh, shot and killed a suspect. You remember that happening several years ago? Chad Hunt was his name. Um, it was a hand-to-hand -hand struggle. But the, the tape, and, and it's a traffic stop on a county road, okay? And Chad gets out of his car, and as he gets out of his car, the suspect gets out of his car with a three fifty seven, and bam! Now, Chad's a big boy. He'd make about you and me and maybe you. I mean, he's a pretty good-sized fellow. Um, he's wearing a vest. The bullet lodged in the vest, made a hole, a crater in his stomach about the size of a plum, but the bullet did not penetrate him. It stayed in the vest. Um, the guy stood over him with his gun like he was going to execute him, and Chad reacted at just the right split second and hit his hand, and the second round took out his mic, his radio mic. That's how close it was. In the ensuing struggle, he turns the suspect gun on, him, on the suspect and, and shoots and kills the suspect. But you can hear on the tape of it, as the suspect goes down and Chad makes his way back to his car for cover, he's calling out to the guy to see if he needs to come help him. That's what they're trained to do. Now, when we get to officer support, we're going to come back to this because there's, there's a footnote here that doesn't show up on any report, but I know about it, uh, and we'll talk about that. So there's a, there's a lot of things about stress here, uh, things to look for, things to be aware of. Um, the third one in that's, that, that looks like this that has stress management at the top, this one. As far as putting it all together, this is one of the best handouts I've ever found, so I keep using it. Um, but managing physical symptoms, cognitive mental system, symptoms, emotional symptoms, behaviors. I mean, this, this puts it in a package. So if I, only had, if I only had one handout on stress, this would be the one you'd get. And there's so much stuff on stress and stress reduction and 
all kinds of stuff. So it, it's out there. You you know that. But realize that, that they're not like TV cops. You know, they can't shoot 14 people and then walk away and go have a pizza and beer. It does impact them. There is a department in Missouri that I was aware of. I don't know if they still, I hope they still do it. If an officer is involved in a shooting incident, here's the order that they do something. This is, this is how they respond to the officer. And again, this is looking at from the perspective of officer support. First thing, as we've talked about, they take his gun. Evidentiary, got to do that. Second thing, they give him a gun. We talked about that, identity. Third thing, they assign a chaplain to him. Before they call the lawyer. Now, here's where that thing of clergy privilege comes in. That puts some help in place immediately for that officer that the grand jury can't touch because of clergy privilege. See how important you could be if your department chose to utilize you? You could be the help for that officer, initial help, initial support. And by the way, you need to understand, cops do not shoot to kill. Cops shoot to live. Remember my definition of a good day? My officers go home. Cops shoot to live. And if you ever get in one of those shooting situations, that's a really good way to reframe it, not only for the cops, but for the public, that officers shoot to live, not to kill. Sometimes they will kill. But they'd rather the bad guy give up his gun and you know get on the ground and stuff like that. But officers shoot to live. That's Jack Poe taught me that. That's just a good way to reframe it so that you realize that their intent is not to kill. They would just as soon not shoot the guy. You know, somebody said, well, it would have been better if they'd got to, to shoot the shooter in, in Connecticut. You know, some sense of justice. Everybody would feel better about it. Justice was served. He got his. And I mentioned that to some of the officers, and they said, no. You got to deal with that. You know, we had a suicide by cop. You know what a suicide by cop is? It's where you don't have the guts to kill yourself, so you ask a cop to do it. You know, you put yourself in a situation where a cop's got to shoot. We had one of those on Christmas Day in the emergency room four years ago. Suicide by cop. Plain and simple. Guy had a knife. Wouldn't put the knife down. Coming across the room, they shot him, killed him. People had trouble with that. Why didn't they shoot the knife out of his hand? Okay. Are you familiar with the term closing distance? Does, does that mean anything to you? What is it? What's closing distance? <laughs> Amen. They say, and they've, they've actually shortened it because of some of the weapons that are out now. You have to respond. If they're within that distance, shoot them, basically. It used to be 21 feet. Now it's 18. Gun or knife. After that incident, we had a spouse support meeting. Brought the spouses in. Gave them a chance to share their fears. You know, I hate for my husband to be out having to do this, you know, how do I deal with this as a spouse, you know, and, and I didn't teach anything, I was more of a facilitator, just letting them talk, and I said, okay, let's, let's talk about this closing distance, okay, in a, in the hospital room that they were in, mm, maybe from, from here to the wall, that's, that's the distance between the officers and the suspect, okay? So we set this up, and I had one of the, the spouses, one of the wives, was going to be the cop. I said, okay, you're going, to be, you're going to be over here holding your gun like this. You know, you're, you're ready. You're, you're holding your gun. You, you're 
got him lined up, you know, everything, you know, you're ready to go. And I said, I'm going to be the bad guy. And I walked over, so I was about 12 feet away, something like that. And I told one of the others, okay, you're going to count, you know, 1,001, 1,002, so we can see how long it takes to get from there to there. When she started counting, I went. She got fat out, and I was already at the officer. They don't have three hours to make a decision whether they're going to shoot or not. You know, they had th, and they shot him. Okay. Both of my officers went home that day. It was a good day. Did I check on those officers? Yeah, I did. A couple of Christmases, too. You know, hit the anniversary because Chad Hunt, whose incident was seven, eight years ago, still has flashbacks on anniversary day. And all, you know, it's kind of an unspoken agreement with, with Chad. Somewhere around that day, he knows I'm going to say, you doing okay? Had to make that death notification of that suspect. It's the first time I've been told by an officer to put my debt, my, uh, my vest on to make a death notification because we didn't know what we were getting into. Family was very anti-law enforcement. And that was an adventure. Let me tell you, you'll stop and think about that and, and chaplaincy if an officer says, put your vest on. You got your vest? Go put it on. Okay. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, so you got... Lots of things here about, about stress, post-traumatic stress, those kind of things. Um, the last sheet you have there is, is dealing with the media. We've already kind of talked about that. The simplest rule is don't talk to the media. Now, when he was in Grand Island, Chief Cordham was the PIO, Public Information Officer. Usually when there's some kind of incident, the department will designate somebody to talk to the, to the media. That way they're not getting conflicting stories. That way they're not, um, you know, tying up four officers. Uh, usually somebody's going to handle the media. Do the best that you can to make sure it's not you. <laughs> you don't want to go there. Uh, they'll try to, the media may try to put you in that role, but, but don't let them. And just say, you know, the department has not authorized me to talk about this incident. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about spouse support. If you need to stand up and stretch a minute or two, that's fine. Uh, anybody need a, a bathroom break or you want to just keep going for a little bit?